get it started. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Lynn Goldman, and I am the Dean of the Milken Institute School of Public Health. And I see that we already have uh, more than 350 participants logged on to this virtual town hall meeting. Because of you know, some of the inherent limitations of the technology, I just want to say right from the beginning that we are not going to be able to have open mics for the audience. We instead are going to use the chat box in order to gather questions. And so I'd also appreciate that to only, only put your, um, your questions in um, if you have a question or it's a different question than a question that somebody else has asked and try to avoid comments like I agree and other comments like that, which are supportive comments and are usually great comments to see, but we don't need to have them when we're going to have trouble kind of following all the questions as it is. So as you know, there have been major changes announced across our campus in response to the COVID-19 epidemic that has reached Washington, D.C., where we're now seeing some transmission here, which is causing a lot of things to happen, not only on our campus, but on our community as a whole. And on, um, on our campus, as you know, we um, had an email first thing this morning from our Department of Human Resources that is basically setting um, a process whereby by Monday um, on campus, in terms of employees, we're only going to have the essential employees of the university in place. And everybody's scrambling to figure out what essential means. Now, if you have any questions about the HR issues, our panel is not going to be prepared to answer that, but I did want you to, to I did want to mention it because if you did not catch that email this morning, I myself am even falling behind in reading all these emails. You should take a look at it. And I think you're all aware also that we have spring break next week and after that we're committed to as much as possible providing instruction online for the next two weeks at least after spring break. But we're here today to talk about something else. A number of students and other members of the community approached me about the fact that although we have had a focus on educating our health and medical community about some of the aspects of the coronavirus epidemic, that we have not made our experts available to the broader community to answer their questions. And so I invited um, Dr. Barbara Bass, who is the Vice President um, for Health and also the Dean of the School of Medicine and also and the sciences. Head and Health Sciences. Oh, I don't want to offend the Health Sciences people, sorry. Mm -hmm. And also the Head of our Medical Faculty Associates to come, but also Dr. Gary Simon, who is Head of Infectious Diseases in our Department of Medicine and a real expert in the clinical aspects of managing viral infections of all kinds. And I, of course, um, the Dean of Public Health, and my expertise is more in the area of epidemiology as well as preparedness and response. And so um, we are not going to do a, a formal presentation. At, because we only have a brief time, what we want to do is to be able to answer your questions I'm going to take the first one I saw, which is no longer on the screen, which was whether we need to be concerned about items that are imported into our country from areas where there is an epidemic such as China. And the answer is, as far as I know, no. That country of origin of a product is not a concern that I've, I'm aware of no cases of any, not only COVID-19, but any respiratory viruses like that having been transmitted in that way. And so I don't think that you have to be particularly concerned about country of origin of consumer products. I, I see a second question about, um, do you want to add anything you know, to that? I just want to say, I, I do have a couple of opening comments I'd like to make about our medical preparedness, if you don't mind. I don't mind that at all. I, I would say you need to, to speak up in this room um, the, because the, the microphones mm -hmm. yeah. don't pick so yes. Um, so let me let me just say just a few brief words, just because I think we we have so it's such a moving target right now in terms of our preparations. So I just want to let everybody know that we actually are 
making substantial preparations for what really could become a, you know, a wave, a wave of uh, demand for our healthcare system. And we are uh, not only um, preparing for on-site facilities, but we're also uh, really making sure that our frontline providers are well informed and prepared to be there as best as we are possible to be. Um, specifically to our campus in terms of medical preparedness. As you know, we have the MFA as a clinical practice site, we have Colonial Health as a practice site for our students, and we have the George Washington University Hospital as a, as a practice site for those that are very ill. We have all been working together very closely to coordinate the care efforts for everybody that comes through our doors. Um, in order to, one, one new thing that you're going to see going up today uh, and over the weekend will be two tents that actually are going to become our coronavirus screening, uh, screening uh, places. We want to try and segregate those people that have respiratory uh, symptoms from the rest of the, rest of the uh, patients that are coming in to be seen for a variety of conditions. There will be one adjacent to the emergency room, which is for those patients that are accessing the their care through the GW emergency room, but for those who are coming by way of their primary practices uh, through the MFA or Colonial Health, we'll be setting up a tent adjacent to um, the MFA building that will be able to screen people uh, and provide testing for those that warrant testing uh, in that venue. The idea being we want to uh, limit uh, the exposure of both our healthcare workforce, but importantly, our other patients that are coming into the MFA practice site buildings, buildings collectively, uh, to try and minimize the exposure of our healthy patients. The other thing that we are doing uh, to, again, um, the fundamental rules that we are embracing are those that Dr. Goldman has, Dean Goldman has mentioned several times, and we are gonna, we're working on social distancing, right? That's our, that's our fundamental tool right now. Um, and um, so we are going to, today and Monday, um, begin uh, limiting, uh, notifying our patients that if you're not sick, if you're just coming in for a routine well visit in the clinic, you know, your annual visit, your annual, you know, check up with your doctor, we're going to ask that we reschedule that, uh, both to protect you from uh, coming into an environment, but basically to honor the, the current best practice in public health to stop this kind of spread, to help us establish social distancing for all of our patients uh, and for all of our community. So it's part of our contribution to supporting the public health initiative. The other piece I want to mention, so, so that notification in our staff, we have mobilized uh, uh, emergency preparedness um, um, programs within the MFA, within the GW hospital system. We have on-site active uh, teams that are managing this evolving situation on an ongoing basis, a minute-by-minute, -minute, hour by hour basis to, to both provide care to our patients as well as to protect our healthcare workforce and all of the people that work in that space with us. I want to say just a word about testing as well in terms of coronavirus testing. Uh, as you know, uh, nationally, uh, a major issue for us has been lack of access to the coronavirus testing to determine whether you have it or not. And what is the best sequence for timing for that? We'll let Dr. Simon chime in on, on uh, the, uh, the best practices relative to when uh, to um, test people. But right now, we have a limited number of uh, test kits available. We have been using them on, an, on a very um, appropriate basis relative to those patients that have come in with symptoms that warrant, um, that warrant uh, testing to determine if they have COVID. That said, um, we don't have an infinite number of those tests right now. We hope that that supply uh, will augment by next week. We also hope that the turnaround testing time for those kits will diminish substantially next week. Right now, we have a limited supply, and it takes two to three or more days to get the results back. So um, remember that if you have symptoms, we, uh, if, you are, if you are doing well at this point, uh, I guess Dr. Simon can ch chime in for me, but uh, if you are a, a person who has respiratory symptoms that are not extreme, we want you to stay home, take care of yourself, uh, self uh, self isolate as we are doing with everyone. But if you get sick, sick enough to feel like you're having trouble breathing, or you're really uh, you're in serious illness, you need to come in. Uh, you need to come into the hospital, the, the healthcare envi environment, to be 
uh, evaluated like you would in any other uh, illness situation. We do, uh, we've actually set up sites so that you don't necessarily have to call ahead, but we would prefer that you call ahead, even though we've set up these screening sites on, on site. Is that clear or do we need some clarification that, on that? That was clear, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Dr. Simon to say a little more and also to address some of the questions we're seeing. But just to reiterate uh, what Dr. Bass said, you know, the, the three things that we're encouraging people to remember is certainly if you're sick, don't go to work. Don't go to work, stay at home. Um, to cover coughs, not with your hand, but with a tissue that you can throw away or your shoulder or your elbow. Avoiding skin-to-skin -skin contact, social distancing, but especially avoiding skin-to-skin -skin contact or contact with surfaces where somebody else could have deposited the droplets um, from, from an infection. But, um, but Gary, I mean, uh, there are a lot of questions that, that, but I want to stay on the testing ones first. Yeah. And because uh, people are obviously very concerned about why can't they get a test? Why not get a test if I don't have symptoms? What, why not get a test if I have the symptoms? Um, and, um, and that whole issue of testing access, what currently are, are you doing? And then there are even questions about what is the MFA and where is it? So I think it wouldn't hurt for you to tell them where to go. The MFA is on 22nd at I Street. Yeah. But the testing sites will be at the various uh, tents. Now, we have to understand that yes, there's a very limited number of tests. Uh, despite you've heard there's two million, te a million tests out or two million tests out, first you can't run all those tests at once. And this is a very big country and two million tests are not gonna go very far at this point. So who gets tested? Well, certainly if you come into the hospital and you have symptoms of fever, shortness of breath, uh, cough, we're gonna test you in the hospital. That's a separate group. Most people do not have those symptoms. If you have short of fever and a cough, exactly what's been said, please stay home. If you get sicker, you can come in. It's possible you just have influenza, but we don't have enough tests really to go around to make sure that you're negative. Now, the, the next group is the people who have been exposed. Let, let me step back. If you have fever and cough and you've been exposed and you just got back from Germany or something like that, we'll test you. But let's imagine a scenario where you find out that the person you had dinner with last night is positive and you want to be tested. No, not now, certainly, because we need time for this virus to develop if you're going to get infected. So you're better off waiting for five or six days and, and, and to see if you develop, even develop symptoms. Uh, moreover, that type of exposure, we would like you to stay home for 14 days, although 14 may be an extreme at this point. We're, we're still looking at that. It may be a little shorter. Uh, if you say, I'm really worried that I might have this, I haven't been exposed, no, we're not gonna test you. We can't, we can't do that. Uh, we don't have enough tests, number one. We don't have enough testing so sites and, not, and even places that are doing tests don't have the facility to do that many tests on people who are so-called worried, but really don't have a good reason for this. I think that's what I, think I can say about testing at this point. Could you um, talk a little bit about the symptoms that okay. you said if they have the symptoms, so to be quite clear The major on that. symptoms are fever, cough, and shortness of breath. Now, in the first day, only about 50% have fever. But within a couple of days, almost everybody, about 90% of people will have fever. Runny nose, Probably not, that's about 10% of patients. Sore throat, the same thing, 10% of patients. So most pay people who have that type of upper respiratory symptoms probably do not have coronavirus. Gastrointestinal symptoms, 5%. Um, these are just very uncommon uh, parts of the, of the spectrum of the disease. Fever, cough, and shortness of breath. Could we mention that actually right now and some of the testing that we've been doing at the hospital and the MFA, we're finding that there is going through the community a cold that we're detecting up that and uh, and so that's something that especially so upper respiratory symptoms, runny nose, sore throat, that's not coronavirus. I mean it's not COVID scientific. Yes, it's it's yes. the common coronavirus, the good old ones that gives us colds. So and we are actually finding those in some of our screening respiratory screening things. So the, the symptoms that Dr. Simon points out are really the ones that uh, get our attention. Yeah, and just to confuse the whole world, uh, there, COVID-19 is not the only coronavirus, and there are other ones that go through 
every year and cause colds. And, and they're not pandemics and they're not serious, but um, people might be told they have that. And, and so we're working on that communication challenge. I saw a couple of public health questions and I'm gonna turn again uh, to Dr. Bass, but in terms of the, the question about what about a contact of a contact, basically? You've got a child, so it's a contact of a child who is a contact of someone who's sick. Or, or you have a colleague who's a contact of somebody who is known to be sick. Those people do not need to be quarantined. They do not need to be um, to stay home. If they have no symptoms, if the person that they're in contact with has no, has no symptoms, then there is no need to quarantine those people. And, and so, and we have that on our website, I think now in, in the FAQs. Uh, on the other hand, if, if I were one of those people, I would stay in touch with my contact because if they develop symptoms, then that might change my status as being somebody who needs to watch, be watchful and see if I'm developing symptoms as well. Because we do know that there has been the spread of this disease from people without symptoms. I think mostly it's not, mostly it's people with symptoms. The other question I saw is what about masks? What is the role of masks? Masks are most important for people who are involved as either EMS employees, hospital employees, other healthcare employees who are just constantly um, in environments where they might have exposures, but also where they might be coughing if they suddenly develop the disease and we don't want them exposing patients. So, because of course, many of the people who are most vulnerable are people who have um, certain chronic diseases and those healthcare professionals and EMTs are often in contact with those people. So, um, in terms of for the general public, you will see people wearing the mask. It is true that a surgical mask, if you have it over your face, you're less likely to touch your face. And that's one of the things we want to avoid is that behavior. If you touch your face, touch your nose, touch your eyes, if there's virus there, you could pick it up and you spread it somewhere else. Or if you've picked up a virus from the environment, you can put it there. So the mask can help that. And also, you know, if you're coughing or sneezing, the, the mask will pick up droplets, but as Dr. Simon pointed out, that's not by and large what this looks like. It might be coughing, but not really sneezing. Yeah. So I, I, we are not recommending that people um, get masks or use masks. As a matter of fact, we're worried about the shortage of masks and whether there's enough actually for all of our nursing um, personnel and other personnel who really need them. And you know the people who kind of, instead of running away from an epidemic, run in there to try to help other people, we want to make sure that they're protected. Um, so, and then the last kind of small question, the dogs as a way of possibly communicating, not that I know of. I don't think you have to give your dog a bath every time after you take your dog out for a walk or something like that. So, um, I mean, I think that um, we're, we're much more concerned um, about, you know, kind of human to human contact and contact through animals. So, Barbara, oh, I saw a couple of questions yeah. about uh, ongoing educational activity for um, exactly. medical students, allied health, uh, university-wide. Um, and just to clarify, the university is, quote, staying open. We are not uh, closing the university, discontinuing our educational activities, but we are making important changes in how we are delivering our educational content across the university. Um, so anything that is a lecture kind of format is going to um, to online learning. Just yesterday, for the specific question I saw from a medical student, our clinical small group conferences are also going to virtual uh, presence starting on Monday. We're in the process right now of training all of our, because we don't have spring break till the following week, uh, of training up our clinical faculty who run those conferences so that we can do them all as virtual get-togethers. Um, you know, we've had the guidance about three to one kind of room size. We're kind of breaking the rules right here, I think. But, uh, but uh, the um, no, we're okay in here. <laughs> okay, okay. But the um, for the students, we are moving all of that stuff to uh, online video for every every single class, one, two, three, and uh, and four. We actually have some um, simulate. We, we've canceled all of our. Um, simulated patient kind of educational programs right now. Uh, we're going to be providing some alternative content for our 
students that need that uh, stimulation-based uh, patient experience um, and other kinds of, uh, you know, educational opportunities for those that are, you know, have, have uh, sim-based training and things like that. But stay tuned. There's, there's a communication that goes out every day from the uh, associate deans um, of the deans in the School of Medicine and Health Sciences relative to ongoing activities. Um, and but that this is new that we're going to move even change all those small group things as of Monday. Uh, the other piece is what about students on clinical rotations, right? And uh, for now, we are uh, as and this has been again guidance. Uh, you know, every place is dealing with this a little bit differently around the country, but for the most part, we are keeping our uh, allies, our medical students, allied health that are on clinical rotations as part of the clinical care team in their educational environment. So we're not removing you from the teams unless you're sick. If you're sick, you stay home and we'll deal with the consequences in terms of days missed and things like that. Don't ever come to work because you're worried if you're sick. Okay, that's number one. But we'll, um, but we will actually uh, have them continue as participants on the clinical care team for now. However, if there is a patient that is a known COVID positive patient or a patient who is a person under investigation, our students will be excluded from uh, that care team. The idea is that we need to preserve our PPE um, materials. And so we're going to try to limit, again, both in supporting social distancing as well as preservation of resources. We're going to limit our care teams to as small a group as possible to uh, optimize our ability to continue to have workforce to care, workforce and stuff to care for the patients. We're in discussion, for those of you who are on clinical rotations, we're in discussion about uh, limiting student participation in the operating room. Again, it's not that we think that's a particularly high risk, but it's, um, it's the idea of preserving uh, what we feel will be needed resources in the weeks ahead that we just are not quite sure of. Um, the, uh, anybody that I see another one about uh, SIM checkoff, things like that, we are regrouping on all of the current uh, requirements for that. Uh, again, we're not the only medical school in the country that is facing this challenge. And just stay tuned, um, and we will um, likely, if it's close, like in the next week, it's going to be postponed. If it's late April, we're going to have to wait and see. So again, stay tuned. I wish we had clear guidance for longer, longer term uh, events, but for now, this is the best we can do. I'm going to go back to a couple of the questions that really Gary um, could respond to, and which has to do with people with um, certain diseases. I, I mentioned autoimmune diseases and rheumatoid arthritis, but maybe other, you know, kinds of diseases involving the immune system. Um, you know, are they particularly susceptible? But also, are there things that they can, people can do to boost their immunity, um, taking vitamins and things like that? Um, I thought those were two very important um, questions. And then another question, and I'm sorry about the randomness of this, Gary, but also, you know, you know really, what is the cause of death for people who are dying for this? If it's very, very severe, um, that was one of the questions. Okay, in terms of uh, underlying conditions, uh, chronic pulmonary disease is a problem because you, your, your pulmonary reserve will be less. Uh, other underlying conditions is, at this point, rather confusing. If you look at the data, there are very little, very few cases associated with certain autoimmune diseases. Uh, in, in light of what I'm saying, let me tell you about why some people die. Sometimes a very small percentage of young people die, and they seem to be dying as a result of an, over, uh, an overabundant immune response, an overexuberant immune response. And so there are some at least potential trials or therapeutic uh, interventions where we're giving things to reduce the immune response. Whether that's going to be effective, I don't know. This but is a tiny, tiny group of people. Right? Yes. Tiny yes. group of people. Very yeah. tiny. Yeah. Very tiny. A minority. Very but, like, but, but important. Than... But the young people are not dying. I mean, yes, there are cases, but that's a very small percentage. The older people who are dying are probably related to underlying pulmonary diseases or uh, conditions such that they don't have enough of a, a total body response to be able to handle this infection. Um, and by the way, that was true in 1918 during the big influenza epidemic, that young people died because of an incredibly responsive, incredible immune response. So I, don't, I doubt that that's the case in the elderly patients. But 
being older, and I hope it's being physiologically older, not chronologically older, um, and having underlying disease, under, underlying pulmonary disease, especially. Uh, let me think. You asked me something else. Uh, I've got a couple of other questions, and then we'll, we'll come back around. In terms of the questions, particularly about the Corcoran and the practice space, we will follow up on that, um, meaning um, those of us who are involved with the overall university response to understand what is continuing to actually happen at those spaces to see what the facts are. I, I have a feeling that um, those are no longer open given all the other things happening on campus, but we'll make sure that there's clarity about what's happening with the practice spaces in the Corcoran. Uh, the, um, the question about President LeBlanc and how is he being informed and how does he know what's going on? So the university has activated something called the Emergency Operations Center, or EOC. And actually, uh, the three of us in one way or another um, at different, in different roles do interact with the EOC, but at the very top, the EOC does report to the leadership of the university. There, there is a process uh, for the EOC to keep the president informed of everything that we're doing, and that's why you have seen the communications that have been coming from President LeBlanc, which are all um, decisions that have filtered up to him through the EOC process one way or the other. So there, there is a, really a, on an on a almost minute-to-minute -minute basis information that's being provided to the president that is being filtered to him through a process that obviously um, only distills upwards the most important issues and the ones that, are, that require decisions on behalf of the entire campus. So I, I think you should feel assured by that because I, I think it's an unprecedented level of um, coordination across all of GW's schools and entities, the hospital itself, the MFA, um, all the affiliates that do the clinical work, the, the coordination has been fabulous, and I think that it has put uh, President LeBlanc in a position to be able to make the decisions that need to be made. I, I, some of the questions go to whether um, um, these concerns are hyped up. They're not, they're real concerns. They're very real concerns, and at this stage, uh, very, very drastic action had to be taken because of what we can see about the dynamics of the epidemic from what we can observe for how it funked, how it worked in other countries, what's happening here. We can see that we're at a stage where it's moving very rapidly. And so it's, it's good to be able to anticipate that and we're trying to get members of our community out of the way and into safety as quickly as possible. It's why the whole region is also closed. It's, um, it's public schools, and we're, I think we're gonna see far more of that. DC government has cut back on its hours, essential employees. And so really, you know, we're in a situation now where in this entire community, that's what's going on. Th that's not what's going on in every community across the country. And so, you know, the, the pace has been different in different regions. We're a little behind Seattle, we're maybe a little ahead of some other places, but it's just the stage we're at now. Um, in terms of is it going to get worse, well, yes, because the epidemic has been seeded in many other places and aren't yet where we are. Um, we will see more transmission here. We don't know how much. I can't possibly, cannot possibly predict how many cases we'll have in any one place. Not, none of our epidemiologists have the ability to do that because we're working very hard to get in front of it to the extent possible. Um, with that, I, I think I wanna go back again, I, I think again to, to Gary, there was a question about the biofire testing and I don't know if it's possible to, to roll back to that. Um, and, um, and I think it goes to some of our clinical protocols as well. How as, as, as Dr. Bass said, a lot of people have other colds and other respiratory infections. Um, Biofire is a means of determining uh, the, the microbial etiology of, a, of an infection. So it's a respiratory biofire, uh, which uh, lists a wide variety of, of, of pathogens that may cause infections, some bacterial infections, viruses, other non 
COVID-19, coronaviruses, adenovirus, rhinovirus, and so on. We can do biofire. We've elected to stop doing them now for the primary reason that we don't have that many probes. And so that biofire doesn't help us eliminate COVID-19. Now, one can say that if you find influenza on that biofire, it makes it extremely unlikely that you have COVID-19. On the other hand, we need to preserve probes right now. We may go back to be doing two separate probes in order to get a biofire, but last night we decided to hold off on the biofires to preserve the probes. So, in an answer, one of another question, which I think is a very important question, we have had some people on campus who have been quarantined or rather self-quarantined. Uh, to my knowledge, none of them yet have tested positive. No for the COVID-19. Um, however, all, all of them weren't tested. I think only symptomatic people were tested. And in one case, they had a different virus, as, as has yep. been pointed out, that can happen. So there was a, a question about the, uh, the physician assistant program, the PA program in health sciences. If we can so I would say pull it back up, but also the um, PA. The, the residents have yeah, so all of the all of the learner groups there. currently that are on um, okay the first part okay I, I see that question now yeah um, any didactic learning um, in all, the school of medicine health sciences and in fact across the entire university at this point is to be delivered by virtual presence you know by WebEx or Zoom or whatever it happens to be that's across the entire the entire um, GW University community. That applies to our health sciences classes, PAs, uh, their allied health people, nursing, um, and, uh, and medical school. Yeah. The clinical rotations, if you have them, whether that's at the VA or off-site clinics or uh, you know, here in some of the GW environments, they're to continue uh, for as long as we can, provided we have enough personal protective gear um, and we don't escalate into some different uh, state of, um, of urgency. And so again, right now, the answer is continue. Now, we are hearing that some sites, some of our students go off campus to other sites, and we're hearing that some of them are not, um, do not wish to have students coming in. If that's the case, we're just, we, you, you don't go, right? Obviously, you can't go or you're not welcome. We also, as a School of Medicine Health Sciences, we often have students that are on away rotations, like across the, the nation uh, on different electives that are preparing for their, you know, fellowships or, or residency programs, et cetera. We have canceled, um, we have advised our students that they will not be able to go on those, uh, those electives to off-sites right now. And so they've all been informed as of a week or two ago, or maybe I guess a week ago, to cancel those trips, and they have all done so. For work, our, our deans and all of our, um, medical school health, allied health programs are working to come up with appropriate alternative um, uh, you know, programs to meet the requirements uh, for graduation. And again, remember, this is a national issue. It's not just us who are, who are suffering with this uh, unknown. All of our schools across the country, the LCME, which is the group that oversees a lot of and other uh, oversight bodies are all struggling with how to do this to make sure that we both meet the requirements um, as well as in terms of educational opportunities, but also uh, deal with what is a very real problem right in front of us right now. So the, we had a question, a couple of questions actually, about people who are pregnant who are working um, in healthcare. And uh, Gary, could you address the issue of um, the susceptibility of people who are pregnant and, and are there special considerations that are being made or not in, with this particular virus? This is a yes or no question. Um, there's no evidence that women who are pregnant are at greater risk for this virus. However, women who are pregnant are at greater risk for respiratory infections, especially as you get later in the course of the pregnancy because the, the lungs are, are slightly anatomically compromised by the large uterus. Mm -hmm. Let me put it this way, there, there's, no que there's no issue regarding or no knowledge that it causes any damage to the fetus on the one hand. On the other hand, if I were making rounds today and I had one resident who was pregnant and one resident who wasn't, 
the non the non pregnant resident is going to take care of that patient, just to be a, as an abundance of caution. And, and I think we would all change. do that. We, that the, through the GME office here at GW, we have made that decision. Yeah, we always that, do that. Yeah, so yeah. That's, that's in case. That's the case right now. Yeah. Now, you may not be willing to tell people you're pregnant yet, but maybe this is the time to fess up if you're, uh, if you're concerned about this. Yeah. So I feel a lot of questions around the issue of quarantining and social distancing. And first and foremost, I think when we're talking about quarantining yourself, we're really talking about to the extent possible, staying at home, not going to work, not going onto campus, not um, going out among people um, and spreading the illness. But then there's this special issue that a couple of you raised about well, what if you have little children? And that is a challenge because uh, young children are not particularly susceptible to this virus. Um, the experience in other countries has been that we haven't seen severe illness in children, we haven't seen children of dying from this virus. However, respiratory viruses in general, young children are very good at spreading them. They're very good at it. They are and vectors of disease. They are vectors, <laughs> they are disease, you know, as we, we have a technical term called fomites. Um, they're like little fomites, they can get Gary laughing. But we, we, so we know that the children, even if they appear to be well or just have a small cough or cold, could be spreading the virus in the community. And so, you know, during this time when the schools are closed, that uh, when your children are in contact with other children, and I hate to say this because as a pediatrician, I know it's very important for children to play, for children to be outdoors, for children to be socializing with other children. But if there's anyone in the household who fits in the category of being vulnerable, elderly people, people, um, adults with respiratory diseases, then I think you need to make sure your children are also staying around the household and because they are very likely to be able to carry the virus into the household. And uh, children have a lot, you can't, you can't tell people don't have contact with a young child as well. They, children have a lot of contact with each other and with others and that's part of why they spread. So I, I would say that it's just, you have to be pragmatic, you have to be practical. Um, parenting is never easy. It might be really difficult during these few weeks when the kids are at home and especially if you have kids that you're going to have to keep at home because of somebody that you're trying to protect in the household. I, I would say also your household preparedness, if you have someone like that at home who you're concerned about, that you need to think in terms of if another household member becomes sick, how do you keep them in a room where they're not having contact with the other members of the household or, or the, so that you have a, a way of managing the best that you can without the household that the illness spreads to somebody in the household who might be more vulnerable. Um, this is not easy, so I, but I would say, you know, to take steps now to, to have that. Other steps, and, and there were a couple of posts about this. Tony Fauci apparently was on television last night at talking about the need to be prepared, which is absolutely true. If you're going to be potentially, you know, quarantining yourself at home for uh, 14 days, uh, you need enough food. Um, you, um, I, I don't think in response to the, one of those questions, you need to have uh, bottled water. I think our tap water here is fine. Most of the country um, has, safe tap water, you don't have to just stock up on, on tons of bottles of water, but other things you might need just being sensible, you know, over-the-counter medicine that makes you feel better if you have symptoms, tissues, that kind of thing. Um, also, if you have medication you need every day for a disease to make sure you have enough of that. And there was another comment up here about, well, some of these medications you have to have an in-person visit to get them. But CDC has instructed the medical community to make sure people have an adequate supply of their medications. And I would not recommend that people go and do routine medical visits right now just to get prescriptions renewed. Um, the physician should be willing to give you refills so that you have enough at home with you um, in case that there is a quarantine. And I don't know if the two of you want to add two, two something to that. We are recommending that patients not come in for routine medical visits unless they're ill. And we have a lot of patients that need medication refills. We do all, we're doing all that online. Uh, don't come in just to get a medication refill. 
so we're sending out that message from the MFA. Uh, I want to add something to the, the issues of children, that I've been immunizing my kids against influenza for 30 years, much longer than it was ever recommended, because we know, and it's been shown in studies, that if you immunize the children, you prevent the grandparents. Mm -hmm. So I'm but sure yeah, that's the let, same me, let me follow up on that, too, relative to this whole this whole disease entity, right? We have, we know this is a highly contagious respiratory illness, Absolutely. right? We know that there are a whole lot of people who are going to have this disease, and we're never going to know they had it. And eventually, we will uh, either get this under control by one of two ways. We'll have herd immunity, where we reach critical mass of, of um, uh, people who have had this disease. And actually, there's a wonderful website that the Hopkins, uh, uh, Hopkins is running that has, shows, shows by the minute the number of cases uh, that, uh, that are occurring around the world with the map. It's a great website. The nice thing about that website also, it tracks the number of people who've recovered. Yes. And today, for the first time, the number who've recovered is greater than the number that have, this, have had the disease. So we're, we're at, there are certain areas where we're reaching that, we're reaching that limit. It's a great website. JH, it's coronavirus jhu.edu forward slash map, and it's a great website. Uh, it's fun to watch just because there's, oh my gosh, but it's actually fun to watch because of the heal the, the cures that are coming along as well. But in any event, what I was going to say is that eventually we're, it's going to get under control either by that method, i.e. herd immunity, or if we can get through this season without, you know, necessarily saturating that infection with herd immunity, it gives us time to come up with vaccines. This is the way we always get these highly contagious diseases under control. We actually, um, you know, we actually develop therapies that treat them or vaccines that prevent them. If we can get through this wave in this country with just a little bump, you know, flatten that curve of dissemination by virtue of these important public health measures we are introducing, social distancing, wash your hands, stay home if you're sick, I mean, all these just kind of fund they sound silly, but they're fundamentally the way you control these infections. Then, you know, come June, July, September, October, we actually, hopefully, even though this is a different kind of organism, we'll actually come up with some effective preventive strategies, be they vaccines or other measures for the next cycle of this, uh, of this disease. We hope it's gonna be seasonal like all the others. We don't know that's the case, but that's a good working, working uh, hypothesis that we all should endorse. Um, but, but that's the way we're going to get through. So we want to limit, we don't want everybody to get this disease. We don't want our herd immunity all at once in the next month, right? Because that's a really hard thing for our health system to, to handle. We can't handle that. We can handle a bump that gets spread out over a few months, and then we keep working on these other measures to control it more broadly. So that's really the strategy we're working on here. As for the school closures, I mean, it's sort of an interesting question, you know, and this, in many cities, schools are more than just places where you go to learn. They're places where you get breakfast. They're places where, that allow your, and lunch. They're places that allow your parents to go to work. Um, it's really, it's a really difficult call to say whether or not we, we should close schools because these kids, you know, unless they're that, that cohort that have fundamental underlying severe illness, they're not gonna die. They're gonna be part of our big herd immunity. And so in some respects, Letting them do that is, is not a bad idea, particularly if that's also the place where they get fed. Yeah, um, we except really, the dynamic of the epidemic. They are part of the engine of spread. Yeah, I understand. So I think, I that's, I think it's the reason for it. Oh, so it. there's a question here about, and I think it's an alarming message, you know, that the president might declare a national emergency. And that is not something to be alarmed by. I think it's, it's important to understand that the federal government operates under a law that was, um, put forth by Congress called the Stafford Act. And without declaration of an, an emergency, there are things that the president cannot do. Declaration of an emergency allows for mobilization of certain national resources to come in and help people. And, and there are so many local and state emergencies that were being requested by making it national, then the governors and mayors don't have to waste their time applying to have an, an emergency declared it's there nationally, it becomes an umbrella that allows them to take action across the nation. And so, A, I think it's appropriate because what it really means is that FEMA and other arms of the federal government can quickly be deployed um, to come in and help when communities need that. Um, tiny questions here, and I'm gonna move to another medical set of medical ones. 
Um, mass buying toilet paper, I mean, it all depends on how much toilet paper you really need, people. If you, you know, so it's up, you know, how, mu how much do you use in two weeks in your household, you know? So make sure you have enough, but I don't think you have to have a lot of it. Um, I don't, um, you know, but it's not for me to judge either. Um, I think that um, how people can help is a question people um, have asked. Um, our emergency operations center has reached out for volunteers among at least public health students. They'd probably appreciate other students if they're around to help. Um, one of our deans, uh, Jean Migliaccio, is kind of coordinating, um, linking students to them. I, I would say it's really it's hard work. To our community, you mean, or it's a, helping the EOC. The EOC mm -hmm. has a ton of things to do. Um, there are myriads of little things that are being done in order to secure the campus environment and make it safe. And they do need help. And so if people want to volunteer, um, they could reach out to Dr. Migliaccio. Uh, I'll probably regret having said this with several hundred people on the line, um, but um, certainly um, they, they need that. Um, I think the length of time for social distancing, Dr. Um, Simon already mentioned earlier that the, right now the conventional wisdom is 14 days and that might end up being a little bit less. Um, I, I mean, well, that's for quarantine. Social distancing, that's until we see this, um, this turning around. There are a lot of questions that have been up here. You know, how do we know how long we're gonna have to have the campus shut down? How do we know how long we're gonna be teaching online? How do we know how long a number of the measures we're taking will be done. And the answer is we don't know to the extent that we're successful, as Dr. Bass said, in slowing the course of the epidemic, then we might be in this mode for far longer, you know, as we flatten out, flatten out you know, flatten out. But if there's still a lot of active transmission in this area, we're gonna need to continue to do the things that we're doing in order to be mm -hmm. successful in making that happen. That could be weeks, it could be months, if it runs through the community more quickly, um, as it has in some countries, um, it's, it's moving very fast, then it might be sooner. And the, 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 and the other point is just, just so you understand, we, even though in real time um, we have tools like the, the Hopkins um, epidemic tracker, the reality is any case that we learn about today is actually associated with a transmission that happened days and days ago, probably two weeks ago, because there's an incubation period, there's the time to develop the symptoms, to get the test, the time to get the results from the test, the time for it to be reported. And so we're always just a little bit behind in terms of our ability to be aware of exactly where the epidemic is. So I see just one thing, it's quite a few things up here about graduation, you know, future planning, whether it's uh, going to meetings that you would have really loved to go to to present something, those meetings are all canceled through April and we're going to deal with the financial consequences of this on a case-by-case -case basis. Keep track of, of investments you have lost if you've made any payments that, that are not recoverable. And we'll, we're going to work very hard on the top burner item for the University um, president and all of us have been very thoughtful about what are, how we're going to deal with the financial impact of this. But as for graduation, you know, right now we can't say what's going to happen with graduation and everybody wants to make plans in advance. The only thing I can tell you is that there will, if, as this, we sort of have a, a week by week um, reconvene in terms of how long is this um, period of online instruction, when do students come back, et cetera. We have set each week, uh, okay, let's convene and decide about three weeks from now. Um, so we won't keep you hanging out there. And, um, uh, and certainly for graduation, I know there is a university-wide uh, intent to come up with a definitive yay or nay in time to help people modulate their travel plans. At this point, I would say sit tight on any travel plans. But um, obviously everybody really wants that, wants this to be over by then and everybody really wants to have graduation. Uh, but in all honesty, we just can't, we just can't tell you that. Last week when I, or a couple of days ago when I was with the med met with our medical students who were getting ready to get their regalia, we said, don't, don't rent it yet, let's wait, let's wait. We can, we'll get extensions relative to some of those upfront costs 
if need be. Um, I sure hope we can do it, but right now I think we're really in that unknown zone. So, along with everybody else, along with so everybody let's else, let's go up a little higher. There were a number of questions about um, the um, operation of emergency services. Yeah, the emerge here. Am, it's a student-run emerge program. I do not know the answer to that. We'll have to find out. I think many of the students who are part of that are probably going to be off campus, so. I honestly don't know. We can find out, and it'll be sent in one of the. Uh, it'll be posted on the um, um, GW COVID website. I just don't know the answer to that. It's run by medical students. Um, I mean, by uh, by undergraduate. Students. Undergraduate students. training. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. I okay. think I, I think health sciences helps to train yeah, them. Well, and MPs, actually. So I, I think that we sh we'll we'll try to figure that out. So advice about other things like going to the gym, going to yoga studios. Well, obviously, you know, public health has not yet shut those down. And I mean, there were other questions about um, um, what do you mean by even, you know, stronger precautions. It, it could be that if we really move into a full-blown um, situation here with transmission, that public health will take steps to shut down um, places that where people gather, whether it's um, exercise or yoga studios. You, you can imagine all kinds of things, restaurants, all kinds of places where people gather. Um, that has already happened in Italy, for example. If you look at what's happening in Italy, you can go buy groceries, but you can't go um, to a restaurant. Um, I, you know, nobody's asking me, but I wouldn't open a new movie right now. Um, but um, I don't know if people can see this or not, but they just announced a Q&A, a Facebook Q&A regarding GW guidance on remote working starting at 1 p.m. I don't know if we have the links for all of that available that we can tell people, or how does that work? Just the email we sent out to everyone on campus. Point to everyone on campus. Okay, all right. so one o'clock, there'll be some guidance on a Facebook Q&A for those of you who are listening about working at home. So if you, if you know how to use that, uh, you, you need to check your email, but you need to get log on if you have it, log on to your Facebook account, and you'll need to go into GW's Facebook site, and um, they will be doing that as what's called a Facebook Live thing. So um, if you could be doing that even while you're on this call, if you want to make sure that you get in on that. I, I, do, I do know that as the dean, I'm sure we're all having this experience. After that guidance went out first thing this morning, there were 100 questions that people had about what, what does this mean, how do we actually do it, uh, so um, that would be um, good. There's a question about how long someone is contagious. Um, getting back to a health-related question. We're not exactly certain. I suspect that, yes, after you recover, there's a period of time when you still are, are, there still can be virus detected. But the concentration of virus goes way down. And so I think within three or four days, the concentration of virus after recovery is, is low enough that your risk is very risk of transmission becomes very very low. It's also not clear how long people are sick, right? Some people are sick for a few days. Some people are sick for weeks, right? If you're seriously ill, you end up in the hospital being seriously ill, possibly on a respirator. That can be four to six weeks. Most people have full recovery within less than two weeks. Now it's also possible to have a prolonged illness and you're not contagious through the whole thing. That's true. There are people who have been reported with prolonged illnesses and they clear the virus and they're still sick, correct? Yes, yes. Because yes. of some of the downstream consequences of, you know, just your own immune response well, can be a problematic. Many um, people, like me, after they have a viral infection, may cough for several weeks. That's just repairing the lung. It doesn't mean I'm contagious. And I've never had COVID-19, at least up to today. <laughs> so a um, question up here about why do we know why it's so bad in Italy? I do think we do know and I why. I think we do know yeah. why. I think it was a behind the curve, lack of social distancing and other preparations like we were talking about today. We're still on that low flat part of our curve, so we have a chance to intercept this, to flatten that spike that they had. Um, and the spike was just overwhelming. They also have a generally older age group population by about six or seven years older than our our median age, but um, and but they're a sophisticated medical community, especially in the region where this hits. There, the Milano region is a very sophisticated, mature infrastructure place. They just were behind the curve, unfortunately. A slightly different population, but basically a little behind the curve. 
They were, I would say they were strong on medical care and testing. They were much faster than we were to make the tests available, but they were not strong on public health. And, that, and so you need both. The, um, and I think we've been more behind the curve on the testing, even though, um, and, and maybe to some extent on public health, but I, I do think we took action in terms of preventing people from the initial epidemic in Wuhan from coming here. They did not do that in Italy. And so, um, but lab orders, um, there are a number of things um, about that again, uh, Gary. Um, oh, are we talking about the, we're talking about the research labs. So I, I would say, um, the answer on research labs, if, if that is somebody I think actually from the School of Public Health, that Greg Davis, who has been working on this, can work with you on that. We are keeping a number of the research functions um, moving along. We are continuing to order things that are essential in terms of um, keeping, um, preventing uh, destruction, you know, of some of the resources that are related to research. Um, over over this period of time. The test itself, the sensitivity and specificity for the test we have access to, do we know what that is? Uh, we don't have accurate numbers. They're, they're, they're very sensitive, but is that 95%, 98%? And similarly, they're very specific, but once again, there's no such thing as a 100% sensitive test or 100% specific test. Um, we're doing the best we can, and this will sort out over time. For those that are really interested in a, a really great um, lecture that was given on this campus yesterday, there's also a couple online that are very similar. Uh, Dr. An Anika, Anika? No, Hannah Axelrod is in my section. Hannah Axelrod gave a great lecture. Grand with a lot of the data that we're talking about here. It's very informative and it is online somewhere if we could figure out where I, it is. I think we're sending it out. I have okay. a link to it too. Yeah. Yeah, I think the, the one that I viewed needed a little bit of work editing out the first few minutes where they were just trying to get everybody on. But it, it's a brilliant lecture, really and if you want to learn, especially the members of the, of the scientific and medical and public health community who are on this call, it, it's a great, um, it was a great lecture. You did a great job. Mm -hmm. Any any final words? Online via YouTube. Any final words of wisdom um, for it's us? It's going to be available um, online via YouTube. Via YouTube. Thank you for that. Um, you'll go and and by the way, somebody did send out the link for the Facebook Live um, event that's starting in one minute. But um, do you have any final words, uh, Barbara, Gary? Vitamin C will not work. I'm sorry. Vitamin C will not work. Yeah, okay. That is a word. Just that stay is. tuned and to be be part of the solution by separating yourself and staying home if you're sick. Wash your hands and be positive. You know, the vast majority of people are going to get this thing are going to be just fine and, uh, you know, it feels terrible because we can't see it, but it's going to be just fine. Be positive. And, and I would add that we are continuing to keep GW's webpage up to date, go.gwu.edu slash coronavirus. COVID. COVID. COVID-19. COVID COVID sorry, COVID-19. You, you can go there. Um, we link to it off of uh, the Public Health School webpage. I know the School of Medicine links to it off of their website. But, um, and, and do get in touch if you have any issues that are created by some of these changes, either in your education program or in your employment. Get in touch with, you know, your instructors, our deans, your supervisors, there are people at GW who are here to help you. So thank you all for tuning in. Um, thanks thank to you. Barbara and Good Gary for doing this with us. Good to be here. And we'll do these as many times as we need to in this rapidly evolving time, right? Yes. <laughs> okay, there we go. I take it we're off. <laughs>